Well, the wolf has gotten a bad reputation, hasn't it? Uh, a wolf in sheep's clothing, the boy who cried wolf, who's afraid of the big bad wolf. But what has the wolf ever done to anyone? <clears throat> well, in France today, the wolf has started somewhat of a war. Uh, the wolf used to be an endangered species in Europe. So the authorities enacted conservation policies geared toward protecting the four-legged furry predator. Uh, but who's protecting the people is my question, because now the wolf population in France is exploding and he's poaching people's livestock. So French rangers and farmers have been petitioning the government in Paris to loosen the regulations protecting the wolf so they can defend their, fox, their, their flocks more effectively. And it's caused a big kerfuffle with conservationists. But there was a time in Paris, not that long ago, when everyone was unified in their loathing of the wolf. And it explains why the wolf was the go-to villain in European fairy tales from the Middle Ages. So this is the story of Courtaud, the great wolf of Paris. And he sets up our brand new series of messages quite nicely. Middle Ages in Europe were tough. There was the aristocracy and then there was everyone else. The economic situation was so bad that people could barely keep themselves fed. The population was oppressed by the church and the state. The peasantry lived in squalor compared to how we live today. And the Middle Ages culminated in the Black Plague of the 14th century that killed about half the population. And oh, don't forget about the Hundred Years' War between England and France, which was fun too. But as the war was finally winding down in the middle of the 15th century, the residents of Paris were hoping for a reprieve from their misery. Maybe they could finally enjoy some peace. But nature always finds a way. The winter of 1450 was especially harsh. Parisians were relying on wild game for food, and farmland was encroaching upon the forest, so this put pressure on the surrounding wolf population. Wolves are usually harmless to people, but the war had given the wolves ample opportunity to uh, acquire the taste of human blood, and they were hungry. At first, the wolves only attacked the caravan, caravans that went to and from the city, but inside the gates, the people were generally safe. Paris was much smaller back then, of course, and most of the population enjoyed the protection of the Seine River. But there, uh, plus there were the city walls that had been erected during the war. But as the river started to freeze in the wintertime, the population noticed that more and more wolves were prowling outside the walls. And they were getting bolder. And then one night, the wolves found a breach in the fortifications, and they dragged unsuspecting pedestrians off the streets. They snatched children from their beds. And the bodies that were found the next morning were mauled to the bone. The leader of the wolf pack was a massive reddish mongrel who had lost the end of his tail in some sort of dogfight. So the Parisians referred to him as Courtaud, which is translated into English as bobtail. Courtaud and his posse terrorized the population of Paris for weeks the people were living in constant suspense. And by the time the body count reached 40, the captain of the city guard decided to take a stand. His name was Bossalier. Bossalier called the people of Paris to band together and fight. That's what the wolves did, after all. And as a unit, they would prevail over the hellish hounds. First, Bossalier ordered the people to fix the breaches in the wall. And they kept the gate, city gates closed for several days. No one left town, nor did anyone throw food waste over the walls. In the meantime, the people built a tunnel between the main gate of the city and the square in front of Notre Dame, which was also enclosed with barricades. The plan was to deprive the wolves to the point of starvation so they could be lured into Balsalier's trap. So after the wolves were good and hungry, uh, Balsalier left some freshly killed game in the city square, and he opened the gate. The wolves were wary of venturing into such an ominous tunnel. They're very smart. But hunger overtook some of the bolder ones, and they trotted in, and they snatched the bait, and then they escaped into the night. More of their comrades joined them each subsequent night until even Courtaud 
himself was spotted among them. And on the tenth night, Basilir was finally satisfied by the number of wolves entering the city square. And so he closed the gate. The peasants awoke the next morning to scores of wolves yelp, uh, yelping nervously as they trotted around the perimeter of the square. They were trapped. On Balsalir's command, the city guards unleashed a torrent of arrows upon the beasts, and the bloodbath was underway. But killing so many dogs from a distance proved more difficult than Balsalir had imagined. The wounded wolves used their jaws to pull out the projectiles, and they continued to limp around the square. Meanwhile, Corton and his closest mongrel lieutenants took shelter under the great fountain in the middle of the square. For all these dogs to be dispatched in a timely manner, Bosselier and his men would need to descend into the arena and engage in close combat with the enemy. And the people were enthralled by the barbaric struggle between man and beast that was unfolding before them. They cheered as the wolves' bodies were run through with swords and their heads were crushed with great stones. And they groaned as the wolves managed to pick off some of their two-legged attackers and maul them to death. But eventually the humans gained the upper hand. The dogs were all slaughtered, except for Courtois, who was the only thing on four legs left standing. And he bared his fangs as the men closed in, but Bosselier wanted a fair fight. Men were better than wolves, after all, who could only win a fight by overwhelming their prey by superior numbers. So Bosselier had his man stand down as he alone approached Corton with spear in hand. Corton instinctively lunged at Bosselier, who plunged his lance into the massive canine's chest. But the wolf, in his last primitive gasp, slid his body up the spear and sunk his teeth into Bosselier. Both apex predators tumbled to the ground in a writhing heap, and they died together on the bloody battlefield in front of Notre Dame. 300 wolves were slaughtered that day, and the people of Paris let out a tremendous cry of relief. They had faced their demons. It was costly, but they had won. What a story. Can you imagine how scary this must have been? These people lured their enemy uncomfortably close. They isolated their threat. And then they neutralized it. This was man triumphing over nature in its most basic savage form. And then the population of Paris went back to dying the proper way. They slowly withered away in the agonizing grip of cholera. But in some ways, I envy those Parisians. Their plight was terrifying, there's no doubt. But at least they could identify their tormentor. They knew exactly what was threatening them. Therefore, they could face it, they could fight it, and they could potentially be set free. But the same can't be said for Americans today. We are just as frightened as those guys were. We experienced the same primal dread that they felt. But our anxiety is under the surface. It's a slow drip. And we can't even identify the danger. We don't know what's wrong with us. And therefore, we have no plan of attack. So we just slog through life in a constant state of existential angst. This is our united state of anxiety. And we're tired of it, right? It's finally time to face this reality head on. So I'm going to encourage you, if you have a Bible... To turn it to John 14, John chapter 14, we're going to look at verses 1 through 11. If you don't have a Bible and you would like one, well, there's one uh, under the shelf, uh, under the pew uh, on the shelf in front of you, and all you got to do is take out that Bible and turn it to page 901, page 901 in your pew Bible, or if you have a smartphone, you can just scan the QR code on the worksheet in your bulletin. It'll take you straight to John chapter 14, page 901. About a month ago, <clears throat> I read a book that was so poignant and helpful that I just had to share it with you. You see, we have an epidemic of apprehension in America today. In fact, many of us are feeling it right now, and we don't know what to do. So what do we do? We eat too much, we drink too much, and we distract ourselves with nonsense. But all the while, we feel the wolves lurking just out of view. 
And we realize that it's not the symptoms of our anxiety that need attention, the heartbeat, the, the sweatiness, the, the, the mind going crazy. We need to attack the root of the problem. And that's what Dr. John Deloney has done in his book entitled Building a Non-Anxious Life. This is the only book, honestly, I've ever read on the subject of anxiety that has presented some real answers to the problem rather than offering, you know, the kind of the Christian bookstore type answers. And in his book, Dr. Deloney shares what he sees as the six underlying causes of angst in our society. And he offers some real tough solutions to these problems. <clears throat> and, um, and so for the next six weeks, we're going to look at each of these choices one at a time that Dr. Deloney puts forward as the keys to building a non-anxious life. Dr. Deloney is an evangelical Christian. He's with the Dave Ramsey Group. But this book is not addressed to a Christian audience necessarily. He doesn't use Bible verses. But don't worry. I'm going to build an original message with Scripture around each of these principles. And so you don't need to read the book to enjoy the messages. But if you do want to buy it, which I recommend, then just scan the QR code on the back of your worksheet today, or you can find it in any bookstore on Amazon. And by the way, when I recommend a book, I don't endorse and defend absolutely every idea in it, uh, but the general principles really are terrific. And if you struggle with anxiety or know someone who does, I can't think of a better time to start going to our, our Wednesday evening life group that discusses uh, each week's message, Wednesday nights at 630. But building a non-anxious life, it's not going to be quick, nor will it be easy, but it's time to bust our United State of Anxiety. And the first stop in our trip across our United State of Anxiety is the state of reality. Jesus lived in reality. Jesus spoke reality, and Jesus never sugarcoated reality. He just faced what was in front of him, even his impending death. But his disciples would have none of it. They denied this reality, and they ignored it. And so in today's passage, we see Jesus trying to help his disciples face it. And so let's look at the passage, Luke 14, or I'm sorry, John 14, starting in verse 1. Jesus said, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to where I am going. Well, Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long, and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me, when I, believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. The context of this passage is the Last Supper. Jesus was eating supper with his disciples for the last time. He knew he was about to die, and he needed them to face this reality. Because up to this point, the disciples have been ignoring this reality. Look at Matthew chapter 16. It says, From that time Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned to Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, you are a hindrance to me, for you're not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And so Jesus needed the disciples to face the wolves that were surrounding the city. But he also needed them to recognize the good things in their reality 
And that's what we see in this passage we just read. Look at the very first thing we see in verse 1. Jesus said, let not your hearts be troubled. There are no qualifiers attached to this statement, nor are there conditions. Never does Jesus want us to be anxious. Never does Jesus want us to be anxious. We are just not to let that happen. The Greek word behind our English translation of this word means to generally just be troubled. It means to feel agitated, to stir up, to feel restless. So the word isn't very specific. It's all over the New Testament. It's used in all sorts of contexts. So I think the word that Jesus used here could mean any kind of anxiousness. That's why we're not going to waste time during this series splitting hairs. We're not going to try to differentiate between all the various manifestations of anxiety because the cure is all the same. And we're not just talking about clinically diagnosed anxiety, by the way. Anxiety can mean worry. Anxiety can mean rumination. Anxiety can mean just existential unease. It could be social anxiety. It can manifest itself in phobias, depression, anger. So when we talk about anxiety, let's define it as Jesus did. It's anything that agitates your heart. So Jesus was telling the disciples that he did not want them to worry, to ruminate, to be afraid, to be angry or depressed. This was not God's will for their lives. Now, I'm not saying that it's somehow sinful for you to feel these things. I'm not saying that you're a bad person for being anxious. I'm just saying that you don't need to be anxious. And I know that sounds too good to be true, believe me. Because I'm going to guess that for some of you, anxiety has been the biggest, scariest, most imposing wolf in your life. <clears throat> it's your corton. It's always lingering in the periphery, you know, just waiting to strike. And some of you can't imagine ridding your life of him. You can't imagine facing him, let alone killing him. Corton is all you've ever known. And perhaps you've never realized that you don't need to tolerate him. Maybe in some strange way he brings you comfort because he's so familiar and you've just gotten used to him. But folks, you deserve better comfort in life than that. You deserve real comfort. You deserve Jesus' comfort. So how do you slay this demon? What did Jesus tell his disciples? Did he teach them breathing techniques? Did he give them mental exercises to practice? Did he prescribe medicine? And Well, all those things certainly can help. And by all means, do those things if, if those bring you comfort. Medicine and breathing and positive thinking can certainly take the edge off of symptoms. And I'm all for that. But ask any psychologist or psychiatrist. Those things are not the cure for your anxiety. They help. For the cure, though, we need to get to the root of the problem. But I also want you to notice that in this passage, Jesus didn't tell them to necessarily pray more. He didn't tell them to read the Bible more. He didn't tell them to trust God more. Because those seem to be the only answers we get from the church. And again, there's nothing wrong with any of those things. In fact, I highly recommend them. But those things are not going to cure anxiety in most people. They're very useful, and they can help. And they're very useful for other problems in life. But I can tell you from experience that they haven't helped with my anxiety, honestly. Uh, in some cases, they've, they've made it worse. Rather than praying for what I'm worrying about, I end up worrying about what I'm praying for. You ever do that? And it's not necessarily, and folks, I want you to be gentle with yourselves, okay? Um, because anxiety is not necessarily the result of a lack of faith. Well, you, you're anxious because you don't trust God enough. No, I mean, these two things are not mutually exclusive. You can have a very strong faith in God and still be anxious, okay? Those two things can happen at the same time. So you need to be gentle with yourself. But Jesus didn't point to any of those things in this passage where he specifically mentioned anxiety. Instead, he told his disciples to what? To believe God. And he told them to believe also in me, Jesus said. So in other words, Jesus is saying, believe what's real. Believe what's true. Believe reality. Because nothing is more real and true than God, right? 
God defines reality after all. And Jesus, as the Son of God, is the exact human representation of God. So Jesus shows us the definition of reality on the earthy, physical level. But then Jesus got really specific about the disciples' reality in verse 2. And he showed them the good side and the bad side of that reality. First, he told them that he would be leaving them. This was a reality, as we've already mentioned, that they had failed to acknowledge in the past. And this must have been extremely sobering to the disciples. Their last three years with Jesus had been the best of their lives. And then they looked forward to many more years with Jesus by their side. But during their time together, they realized they were nothing without Jesus. Without him, the disciples, they just fell apart. They argued, they doubted, they were afraid. And so a reality without Jesus physically being there was one they did not want to face. But Jesus sat them down during the Last Supper, and he forced them to acknowledge it. And the disciples squirmed. You ever squirm at the thought of reality? Thomas was the first one to object. We see it in verse 5. How can we know the way without you? And then Philip spoke up in verse 8. Lord, show us the Father. You know, they wanted Jesus to alleviate the symptoms of their anxiety. Tell us everything that's going to happen so we won't be scared anymore. Show us something amazing so we'll be distracted. But Jesus wouldn't let them ignore the wolf just outside the gate. He wouldn't let them disregard reality. Jesus couldn't be with them forever physically. It's just not practical, and that was a fact they had to face. But neither would Jesus allow them to forget about all the wonderful aspects of their reality. Because verse 2 wasn't all bad news. Jesus would also go and prepare a wonderful place for them. They would never be separated from him spiritually. He would always be available to them in the deepest parts of their being. So in this passage, we see the dual state of reality. Jesus always pointed out the good parts of life, but he never ignored the not-so-good parts. So I guess you could say that the state of reality is not unlike the Dakotas or the Carolinas. And that's the main point from today's passage. The main point in your bulletin is there's both north and south reality. The state of reality is separated and there's both north and south reality. Folks, life is good. And there's always things in life that are pointing up. There's always things in life that are pointing north. But sometimes reality goes south, right? And this dual concept of reality is found all over the Bible. Let me just give you some examples. The prophet Jeremiah realized this in the Old Testament, Lamentations 3 is it not from the mouth of the Most High that good and bad come? And Jesus talked about both sides of reality. Matthew 5, God makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rains on the just and the unjust. Apostle Paul mentioned it, Romans 12, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Rejoice with those people who are pointing north and weep with those whose lives have gone south. And we know this instinctively. This seems like an obvious observation, but our brains are really good at ignoring reality, aren't they? Some of our brains are really good at ignoring the good things in life because that's what worriers do, right? They ruminate on all the parts of reality that can go south. They contemplate all the bad possibilities that could happen, and they do it all the time but they absolutely refuse to accept the possibility that something really great could happen. Why don't they ever ruminate on that? And it's obvious how this is unhealthy, right? We see how that can lead to fear and pessimism and depression. But you know what's even unhealthier, in my opinion? It's refusing to face the bad parts of our reality. It's ignoring those things that are genuine causes for concern in our lives. It's denying the trauma in the past. Now, on an existential level, I'd argue that circumstances are neither good nor bad. We have no idea how a certain bad circumstance may turn out good or how a particular good circumstance may turn out bad. 
because circumstances, in my opinion, are neutral. But that's a discussion for another day. Without getting too philosophical today, in the ordinary understanding of our reality, our brains are really good at ignoring things we don't want to face. In fact, our brains can build their own reality. And I'm not just talking about, you know, maybe like delusional people. Ordinary people are quite capable of building narratives in their mind that are divorced from reality. Well, you know, oh, my kids would never do that. Or, you know, my husband isn't cheating on me. Or, it isn't really abuse. Some of the narratives someone might tell themselves. But as Dr. John Deloney points out in his book, the body knows what's real even when our brains refuse to acknowledge it. Did you hear that? Our bodies know what's real even when our brains refuse to acknowledge it. And our bodies won't let our brains shirk reality. So it sends out warning signals. That's the dissonance you feel in your life, in your heart, in your body. You feel your heart racing. You, you sense that slow adrenaline drip. You can't concentrate. And all this stuff leads to worry, depression, anger, all sorts of other bad outcomes in our lives. This message is based on chapter 4 of his book from which this excerpt is taken that I want to read to you. He wrote, Your body knows how well you are regardless of how you try to numb it or lie to it. Our bodies are constantly solving for reality even if we are not. Makeup can hide scars, but the scars remain. Bandages can cover up wounds, but the wounds still exist. We can wear masks, feel pity, create distance, or pretend things are different than they are, but our body is keeping score. Your body knows if you're in a safe, an unsafe or abusive relationship, even if he keeps telling you he loves you. Your body knows you're broke and dangerously close to a financial cliff, even if you emotionally numb yourself buying garbage you don't need to impress people you don't like. Your body knows your small business is failing, even if you haven't looked at your profit and loss statements for months. Your body knows your wife is quickly flipping the phone face down every time you walk into the room, even if you're lying to yourself that she's chatting with her girlfriends. And when your, body, when your brain and body believe you're not safe, it will sound the alarms. If we've learned anything during our times together, it's that your brain is not you. Your brain is just a tool that you use. And you are in charge of your brain, not vice versa. Your brain is a crucial part of you, for sure, but it's not all of you. You are not all what you think. And it's an instrument that is notoriously bad at identifying reality. It's great for organizing information and analyzing data, but it's not so great at interpreting those facts. Dr. Deloney quotes Catholic Friar Richard Rohr. This is a great quote. Yes, the mind and reason are necessary, but they must learn to distinguish between what lies beyond its reach. Yes, the mind is brilliant, but the more we observe it, the more we see it is also obsessive and repetitive. Isn't that the truest thing you've ever heard? And your mind struggles to see the big picture of life and recognize the profound truths. It gets trapped in the moment and it needs help. So for your brain to come to an accurate conclusion about the state of your reality, it needs accurate input. It needs you to be honest about the good and the bad in your life. And that's our application from today's passage. It's in your bulletin if you want to write it down. The application is put the real back into reality. It's time to put the real back into reality. Gustavus Adolphus was the king of Sweden from 1611 to 1632, and Gustavus Adolphus loved to fight wars. But wars in the Baltic require ships. So the king was determined to build the most magnificent warship in the history of modern warfare. And the ship was named Vasa. But kings aren't typically known for their patience. Gustavus Gustavus Adolphus needed Vasa built ASAP, and his people started building it. But in the middle of the building, Gustavus Adolphus decided that he needed more cannons on the ship. 
So they added a second full gun deck to accommodate the 64 Bron cannons that the ship had demanded. But no one had ever built a warship that heavy, uh, that heavily armed before, and so they decided to do a lurch test in the shipyard. The lurch test consisted of 30 men running back and forth across the deck to get the boat rocking. Well, Vasa didn't pass the stability test. The ship was rocking too hard. The keel under the ship appeared to be too shallow, and the top was too heavy. But the king wanted his ship right now. So the builders convinced each other to carry on. That'll be all right. Well, on August 10th, 19, or, uh, August 10th 1628, they launched Vasa in front of thousands of cheering onlookers and the grandest warship ever built immediately tipped over and sank. And you think you're having a bad day. What a disaster. And it all resulted from people ignoring the warning signs. But I'm certain they were feeling some anxiety before the launch, right? Their bodies knew the danger was real, even if their brains wouldn't allow them to admit it. And they were certainly feeling anxiety as they had to notify the king about what had happened, who was directing a war in Poland at the time. But that's what you get for blatantly disregarding the reality of the situation. And Jesus warned against this kind of denial. Luke chapter 14, he said, Which of you, desiring to build a tower, does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. So we need to get real. In his book, Dr. Lennon confronts his readers with six choices to build a non-anxious life. These choices are not in any particular order, and they're not like one and done. Oh, I mastered that. I'm going to go on to the next. No, they need to be maintained regularly at the same time. But if any of them could be considered foundational, then it's the one he writes about in this chapter we're looking at today. Dr. Deloney challenges us to choose reality. Indulge me as I quote him again. Being non-anxious isn't about trying to ignore every unsavory and ugly thing. Avoiding the alarms makes them louder and stronger. Being non-anxious also isn't about imagining and trying to solve for each and every catastrophic scenario in my present life either. That's a fool's errand. We have to face our present reality. Real life is hard. It's every single day and it never stops. And then someone you love passes away, you learn of your kid's diagnosis, and it gets even harder. Building a non-anxious life is about realizing reality hurts. No amount of screaming and being angry is going to change the election results or give you your job back or convince your ex to return. For millions and millions of us, when we drop our guard, stop running in anxious little circles, and take a true inventory of our lives, reality can be devastating, heartbreaking, and downright scary. But to heal from anxiety, we must no longer avoid it or run around it. We have to go through it. Our mind is really good at convincing us that there are no wolves prowling around the perimeters, but our body knows. And so it's time to scare down our corton. And this is both a mental exercise and a practical choice. Mentally, when we start feeling anxious about something, I believe we need to name it. We need to practice radical honesty with our lives. After all, God is the author of reality. Right now, you know, whatever the worry might be, you know, right now, I, I'm worried that my child is going to die, or right now I'm afraid that I'm going to lose my house, or right now I'm really bothered by the trauma I endured as a kid. That's facing our worries with radical honesty. But it's also a practical choice. Dr. Deloney encouraged us to take a written inventory of our reality with a trusted friend or counselor, write down the good and the bad in your life. And he has some helpful questions in his book to ask yourselves that you can look at. But you and I here in our, our church, we aren't worried about changing anything just yet because that'll come. Right now, I just want to encourage us to constantly, consciously choose 
reality. Choose what's real. And it's amazing how much this helps relieve my anxiety. The grief and pain we experience in life as we face reality, it gives us clarity and our trust in God becomes sharper. And solutions, no matter how hard they may be to implement in our lives, become very evident. You see, you might not be able to kill the wolf right away. But at least you can see them clearly. And in some ways, calling him out can rob him of some of his ferocity. Yeah, I see you. I see you over there. Whatever that anxiety is, whatever that reality is, I see you. I'm not sure what to do about you, but I see you. And that, I think, is the first step in breaking through our united state of anxiety. Choosing to live in the reality, radically acknowledging the trauma and the bad parts of it and what I'm really worried about and also not ignoring the good and soaking in that stuff as well. And so we're choosing reality for these next six weeks at least. Hopefully we won't go back to ignoring it. There's a north reality and there's a south reality. Reality as good and bad, but we embrace them both. We put the real back in reality, and we start the process of regaining control over our minds and bodies when we do that. You are not just your mind. You are not just a collection of thoughts that you have. Your mind is not God. It's just a tool that you get to use, and so put the right input in it. Input it with reality, and I think you'll get a better output from your mind. But the state of your reality is just the first spoke in the wheel. We've got five more to go. And as we face reality, it comes clear that we can't beat it alone. Because it's just too scary, folks. (laughs) To face reality all by yourself, that's just too scary. And so I'm going to encourage you to read Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47 this week. And you bring a friend next Sunday as our trip across our united state of anxiety takes us through the state of connection. Let's pray. Oh, Lord, it feels good to be here with all of our friends and family as we maybe face some of the scary things that reality can do. And and, um, Lord, I know, I know, a group this size, there's going to be a lot of warriors in this group. There's going to be people who are, have been diagnosed with clinical anxiety or phobias in different levels. There's going to be people who are angry and they don't know why. There's going to be people who are depressed and aren't sure where it came from. And then there's just going to be normal people who just from time to time really struggle with worries and ruminations and and all these types of things. And all of us are touched by it because we live in a fallen world. But Lord, I'm just going to ask that, uh, God, as we go through these next five or six weeks, we know that this book isn't magic. We know it's not a silver bullet or a cure-all. It's just a tool. We want to use that tool. And we want to evaluate it in Scripture. And we want it to heal us. And so, God, I pray that each person here might not walk out of this series completely free but I pray they'd be one step closer to feeling good and having peace and living in the joy that you've intended us. I pray that each of us could face that wolf that's lurking in the perimeter. We wouldn't ignore him, but we'd look at him. And Lord, maybe in some ways that would defang him. And Lord, I pray also we would soak in the good of reality. I pray the people who like to ruminate in this uh, congregation would ruminate on the really great things in their lives. So God, I thank you for what you're going to do and the miracles you're going to work and the healing you're going to provide. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.